What we're going to be doing in this review is essentially a speed run through the underlying math and dynamics concepts that we're going to be building upon in this course. The intent here is not necessarily to teach you anything new. In fact, this should all be review, but the intent here is to jog your memories and maybe also make you remember some things that you've forgotten, and also to introduce a standardized set of notation and concepts that we're going to be using throughout the entire class. So this is going to go rather fast, and uh, you're encouraged to uh, watch these as many times as you need to. And also don't forget that there's the handouts that serve as a companion to these videos, and the handouts are intended for whatever purposes you want to use them for. But in particular, you might find it helpful to use them to take your own notes on top of. So let's take it away. This course is a course about classical or Newtonian mechanics. And Newtonian mechanics is traditionally encoded in the three Newton's laws. Every body preserves in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a right line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed thereon. Things in motion remain in motion. Things at rest remain at rest unless something causes them to move. The alteration of motion is ever proportional to the mode of force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed. So there are these things called forces. They can cause a change in the motion and that change is going to be proportional to that force. So the magnitude of that force and is going to be in the direction of that force. And finally, to every action, there is always opposed an equal reaction or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. Otherwise, frequently stated as for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So as we look at these, we see uh, all three of them, but most specifically uh, laws two and three encode vector quantities. They are talking about things with a magnitude and a direction. And therefore, the correct language for Newtonian mechanics is the language of vector mechanics. And so that's where we have to start our review. What is a vector? Well, a vector is an element of a vector space, right? What is a vector space? A vector space is a collection of vectors over a field of scalars. And here we run into trouble because what the heck is a field of scalars? All right, so let's back up. A field, which we'll call F right here, is a set of scalars, say X, Y, Z, belonging to this F and many others. And it has two binary operations, addition and multiplication. All right, binary operators mean that they take two elements of the field. And so we have F operated on another element of F, and that gives you back a third element of F, potentially a new one. So that's what binary means, okay? And these binary operators don't need to be specifically defined. They just have to obey these seven field axioms. I've stated them as seven. Sometimes they're written out in slightly different forms, but these are the basics of what these operators have to obey. So the both operators have to be associative. And so X plus the quantity Y plus Z is the same as the quantity X plus Y plus Z and the same for the multiplication operator. Again, in your head, you can map these to addition and multiplication as defined on the real numbers because the real numbers are a field. And in fact, the real numbers are the field that we will most often be dealing with in this course. The other most commonly used uh, field of numbers in this course will be the complex numbers. So addition and multiplication are both associative. They are also commutative. And so X plus Y is the same as Y plus X and product X, Y is the same as product Y, X. Every field contains an additive identity element, zero. So this is a special element such that any element of the field X plus the identity element zero is going to be just X again. And every field contains a special multiplicative identity element, which we'll call one, such that the product one X for any field element X gives you back X. And so the existence of these two identity elements requires the existence of inverses. And therefore, every X has an additive inverse, which we'll call negative X, such that X plus negative X gives you the additive identity element, zero. And it, X also has a multiplicative inverse, such that X inverse times X gives you back one, which is the multiplicative identity element. And finally, addition has to be distributive over multiplication. X times quantity Y plus Z is the same as XY plus XZ. So any set with any two operators that obey these seven axioms is a field. And if you don't like this very, very formal statement, in your mind, anytime we say field, just think real number, 
or complex number and the addition and multiplication rules that you've been taught associated with those. Now we can get back to vectors. A vector space is a collection of vectors. Let's call them ABC. We will always use bold-faced letters for vectors. When I write, I will always put an underbar. You are welcome to write vectors however you want. You can use overbars. You can use over arrows. You can use sidebars. Uh, it really does not matter. The only thing that matters is that I have to be able to tell the difference between you writing a scalar and you writing a vector because they are fundamentally different quantities. So you have to, in your notation, whatever that might be, distinguish between the two. Once again, we're defining a set over a field that has two new operators. And those two new operators are vector addition and scalar multiplication. Vector addition is a binary operator. It takes two elements of the vector space and returns another element of the vector space. Scalar multiplication is mixing and matching elements of the vector space with elements of the field that it is defined over. And once again, these two operations can be anything so long as they obey these eight properties. And again, in the literature, you will find these properties remixed in various ways. But the properties are commutativity of vector addition. So for any A and B in the vector space, A plus B is the same as B plus A. Associativity of vector addition, same deal as with the field associativity. And now the vector space will have an identity element which we'll call zero, such that any element of the vector space plus the zero element of the vector space gives you back that same element of the vector space. And that requires the existence of additive inverses, just like in the field. And so there will always exist, this symbol means there exists, a negative A in the vector space, such that A plus its additive inverse gives you back the zero identity element of the vector space. There has to be compatibility with scalar multiplication, which means that scalar x times the quantity y times the uh, vector a is the same as the product xy times the vector a. There has to be distributivity of scalar multiplication over vector addition, and so x times the quantity vectors a plus b must be equal to xa plus xb. There's the distributivity of scalar multiplication over scalar addition, and so the quantity x plus y times the vector a must be the same as xa plus ya. And finally, this is tying into the existence of that identity element in the scalar field. There's the identity element of scalar multiplication. And so there's going to be that scalar element. This is the multiplicative scalar element in the field that the vector space is defined over, such that that scalar one times any element of the vector space A gives you back the same element of the vector space A. All right, so that is it. Again, any set of things that have these two operators that behave in this fashion is a valid vector space. We specifically care about Euclidean or geometric vectors. These are vectors defined over R3, otherwise known as the three-dimensional real numbers. And these are a description of the three-dimensional universe as we experience it day to day. How many dimensions the universe actually possesses is an interesting question and one that physicists and cosmologists grapple with on a daily basis, but our experience of the universe is strictly three-dimensional in the spatial sets. We experience three spatial dimensions, and so this is the mathematical framework in which we will describe the dynamics of our universe. A Euclidean vector is describable by two properties. It has a norm, otherwise known as a magnitude, and it has a direction, otherwise known as the unit vector. So we can think of a Euclidean vector as pointing in space between two points, going from A to B. And the particular notation that I will adopt is that the vector pointing from point A to point B will be written as R of B rel A. So R is going to be our usual notation for a position vector. The letter is completely arbitrary. It's just something that I'll use consistently. So, Again, B rel A is going from A to B. This vector has a magnitude given by the norm operator. Norm of R B rel A gives us this, the length of this vector, the distance, Euclidean distance between A and B. And the direction from A to B will be denoted by the unit vector, which will get a top hat. R B rel A hat is the unit vector. The notation is useful in a couple of different ways, as we'll see. It, it basically helps you keep track of things. It prevents you from making silly algebra mistakes. That's really its only utility. 
You do not have to use this. You can adopt your own notation. Whatever you do, your notation has to help you. That's the key point here. Pick a set of consistent notations that will help you not make mistakes. And then just blindly follow it because you're not supposed to be spending any mental time on just writing things down. You're only supposed to be devoting your mental efforts to actually figuring out important things. And vector algebra is not one of those important things. It should just be automatic. Flipping the direction of a vector, that is going instead of pointing from A to B, uh, going to from B to A, is just putting a negative sign in front of that BRL A vector. And in our notation, it has the effect of flipping the indices, right? So negative of R BRL A is the vector pointing from now B to A, which is R A REL B. And then the unit vector is the original vector divided by its magnitude. And so I can always, always decompose any vector R as its magnitude of R times its unit vector, like so. So I will always be able to do this decomposition for any vector and for any Euclidean vector and split it up this way. Because Euclidean vectors are a vector space, they have to have an addition operator and it works much the way that you have been taught uh, in various other classes. So if I have three points, A, B, C, I can take the vector pointing from A to B, that's R, B, R, L, A, and I can take the vector pointing from B, B to C, that's R, C, R, L, B, and I can add them together, and I should get the vector pointing from A to C. And you can see here how the notation helps you out. R, C, R, L, B plus R, B, R, L, A, the two interior indices line up, and so they kind of just collapse together, and you get only the exterior indices, R, C, R, L, A. This is an example of the notation just removing any kind of additional thought from the process. Same deal. If I want to subtract a vector, right, I want to do, say, our CRL A minus our BRL A. Well, as we've already pointed out, negative our BRL A is the same as our ARL B. Once again, the interior indices line up. C and B are what remains. And so I can, without any thought to it, say our CRL A minus R B R L A is the same as R C R L B. And if you trace the different directions along the triangle, what's sometimes known as a vector triad, you will see that this relationship holds. Just like I have to have a vector addition operator, I have to have a scalar multiplication operator. And the understanding of this one is that scalar multiplication of a Euclidean vector only affects its magnitude. And we can see that by using this decomposition here. So I have x, some scalar x times r b r l a. Well, I can decompose that as x times the norm of r b r l a times the direction of r b r l a. And you will recall by the compatibility, this is just a single product now. This is a larger number because the norm is a strictly positive quantity. Magnitudes are strictly positive. And so if x is positive, this is now a larger positive. If x is negative, it's now a larger negative number. But it, all, it always retains the exact same direction. So scalar multiplication of Euclidean vectors just scales the norm of the vector.